there was this one time where uh, you know I was talking to this jazz trumpeter named Stanton Davis, and he was just an amazing uh, trumpet player. And I knew that Stanton would have some records, and I'd just been waiting for the day to go to his house and find the records. And so on a trip that Madeline and I were taking to uh, Philadelphia, I said, you know, we, we should stop at Stanton's house and see what he has, you know, and then me and you can kind of divide up the records. So we get to Stanton's house, and he has no records there, and it's a nice-looking house in a nice neighborhood in New Jersey, and I'm like, this is going to suck. And then we get to his storage unit, which is all the way across town, you know, near a freeway and some railroad tracks, and I'm like, okay, this is more like it. We get into the storage unit, and we start digging for records, pull up this really incredible-looking record with a paste-on front and back cover called the Christ Gabriel Jazz Missionary Group. And it just looked super obscure. So I just bought it, and I was just like, it's a cool record, man. So I'm like, let me do a little research, get online, and I, you know, see a copy on eBay, and it has a bunch of bids, and, you know. And it ended up selling for, like, two grand. And so I was like, that's insane. That record was recorded with one microphone, probably pressed in a run of 100 copies. And then in trying to find the leader of the, of the ensemble, who Stanton recalled being a bishop, I found this incredible Department of Justice press release. And the reason I was able to find it is because he wasn't actually a bishop. He was just saying he was a bishop. And there was this huge case against him for you know visa fraud that he had done around Hurricane Katrina. And he was locked up. And, you know, so, like, this guy who was obviously a swindler, you know, was, was sitting in jail somewhere. And I'm thinking to myself, how crazy is that? You know, who knows? Maybe him and his, his ex-wife or his mom have some copies of that record, and we'll never know, because so far as I know, this dude's going to be locked up for the next 20 years. My name's Ethan Alipat. I go by Egon. I run Now Again Records here in Los Angeles. I'm also partners with the producer Madlib, and this is Crate Diggers. Well, I come from a family of musicians. My father was a guitarist in India, and my mother was a classically trained pianist. And so music was a big part of my upbringing. We didn't have a TV when I was growing up. My parents were just not into it. They believed that, you know, I should be, and my brothers, and then my sister should be more involved with, you know, the arts. And so we were painting and drawing and, you know, out in the backyard planting asparagus and searching for potato beetles and listening to records. I mean, the art was cool but the records were where my you know, passion quickly became. You know, I just started listening to the records that my parents listened to. I mean, that's just the way that it was. And that was like Tom Paxton and uh, the Hair soundtrack and the Z soundtrack and Sly and the Family Stone and Miles Davis and Dolly Parton and the John Denver and the Muppets Christmas album. And, you know, all that stuff just sort of existed together for me. This is an interesting record by a guy named Stephen David Heitkotter. There was only 20 copies of this record made, maybe 25. Um, Stephen himself doesn't know, and he's been awarded the state for the past 30 years. He was suffering from the first stages of what became all-encompassing paranoid schizophrenia when he recorded this in an old uh, house in Old Fresno. And it's really deep, dark, hard-to-define psychedelic rock music that's clearly made by a, a man who was troubled and when you find out the real story about him and you find out that he was truly on his way to you know losing everything you know having to be committed it's a, it's a, it's a it's a real weird trip and every copy of the record that i've seen comes autographed by height cotter himself sometimes big sometimes really small but it always says the same thing which is just height cotter and the label of course is ego which i suppose is kind of fitting given the story At the moment, I have probably, you know, 10,000 records, something like that. But this is really the stuff that matters to me at this point. I mean, there's, there's a handful of records at my parents' house that are really important to me, like all of my Galt McDermott acetates are there, and, uh, you know, like a bunch of the high school band records that I bought when they were cheap, you know, like the Douglas High um, albums, including Blackout, which I bought sealed in some dude's house in Little Rock and cracked open. and man, I wish I'd kept it sealed now because I would have sold that thing for whatever it sells for, five, six thousand. Um, records like that are sitting in my parents' house and shelves. So, I love funk music. I always have loved funk music. I loved funk music before I knew what funk music was because my parents were into Sly and the Family Stone and I thought Stan was just one of the greatest albums 
ever made when I was six or seven years old. So, of course, I'm a James Brown fan. And as far as James Brown artifacts go, it doesn't get deeper than this. This is uh, two of the three sides that were test pressed as James Brown was under contract with Polydor, but King, his previous record label, was still trying to get out a release. And it was the Love, Peace, and Power show, which was issued on CD uh, in, the, in the 90s, in its original full form. So I talked to Alan Leeds, who is the James Brown historian, and he tells me that they did two sets of test presses. They did two records, which is what I have here, and as you can see in this note, test pressing approved by H.G. Neely. That's Hal Neely, the president of King in 1971. This is during the time that James Brown was transferring over to Polydor, and it's all the information you need there. It contains a ton of stuff that wasn't actually issued on the Love, Peace, and Power reissue, including the JBs at this point, including Bootsy Collins and his brother, like vamping on the grunt as they're like transitioning from Bobby Bird to Vicki Anderson. It's just absolute insanity. And the only way you can get it is by finding one of the original small set of test presses that were made. <laughs> One time in the late 90s, I went and bought about, I'm going to guess, five, six hundred, seven inches out of a, a defunct record store called Eddie Three Way in New Orleans. I sifted through about, I'm not kidding when I say this, like 500,000 seven inches. I spent about a month doing it because I had no money. So that was the most that I could afford to buy. And I kicked myself for not trying to get a loan from record collectors who had deeper pockets than me because I was the first one there. So it was just chock full of stuff. And I left hundreds and hundreds of records. And when people found out about it after me, they cleaned up. There's a bunch of different ways that I've organized this over the years, but you know, at this point, it's just like interesting records that I like to listen to over here. A bunch of James Brown albums because he's the Don. Then you got all like the German records, uh, kraut rock mainly. Then it starts with Brazilian records, Brazilian records, Brazilian records, Brazilian influenced records, and then we get into African records, Zambia, Nigeria, Cape Verde because I'm really into that. We get into rock, you know, Velvet Underground, Beatles records, Captain Beefheart, and then more obscure stuff. A little bit of boogie, a little bit of disco, then funk and soul, which goes all the way over, gets into jazz avant-garde weirdo stuff like there's a bunch of records from you know Russia and Yugoslavia and places like that a bunch of hip-hop then all the stuff that I do with Mad Lib all my old-school hip-hop 12s including the Golden Age stuff Iran Turkey Greece Lebanon Japan Indonesia South Korea India a little bit of Latin music because sometimes nothing but Latin will do island vibes because that's what my wife's really into and then all my high school band records here, which is where all the kind of random high school and college bands start, to over there, which is all Cashmere Stage Band. <laughs> Detroit Sex Machines. When I was in the hospital with Dilla, um, shortly before he passed, I had actually reissued both sides of each of these seven inches on a 12 inch EP. I brought it to the hospital to show him and his mom because I was like, it's Detroit, man, we have something to talk about. I show it to him, and he's like, oh, cool, man. You know, I can't wait to listen to it. And I show it to his mom, and his mom starts reading the liner notes. And she's like, Ted Dudley. She's like, James, you know, didn't your Uncle Clemmer record with Ted? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I think he did. And I was like, what was Clemmer's band called? And she's like, The Ambassadors. I'm like, that's insane. That's the third record on Soul Track. So Dilla's Uncle Clemmer had actually recorded with the band, the Detroit Sex Machines. These two records are just heavy, heavy funk music, some of the best funk music ever recorded, and the Detroit Sex Machines were a high school band. Well, when I was doing my reissue, I was like, how the hell am I going to get copies of any photos of this band, because there have to be some. Well, I'll tell you what I did. I hit up Ted, and I was like, Ted, you got a high school yearbook? And he's like, I sure do. I was like, can I have it? He's like, yeah, I don't see why not. So this is the high school yearbook, as you can see. It's Southeastern High School in Detroit, 1970, Amethyst, some of the most amazing photos in the world. You see the only extant photos of the Detroit Sex Machines. At the moment, I really don't do much like digging per se, like actually going out and like buying records in stores. I focus on regions of the world and I buy everything from them. So for instance, Zambia right now, I buy everything from Zambia that I possibly can. Let me put it to you this way. 
you walk into a Western Union and you say, I want to send a whole bunch of money to Nigeria or Zambia or Indonesia. And you know they hand you this little pamphlet and it's like, what scams to look out for? And then when you still go through with it, they're like, are you 100% sure? And you sign everything and you make sure that it's okay because there's just so many damn scams in that part, those parts of the world. But you know, I've been taken for a ride a bunch of times. The people who've taken me for a ride are largely the people that you meet in you know, Western cities. One of the biggest wants I had was the Question Mark album. This is the most confounding record that I've heard from Nigeria because if you didn't know it was from Nigeria, if you didn't see the cover, if you just listened to it, you'd swear it was recorded in the Midwest, you know, and that these guys were just on some other thing and they were doing some like really polyrhythmic cool stuff because the guy sounds like a high-pitched, nasally, you know, white guy recording kind of as punk is being birthed. It's, it's really hard to describe. So I partnered up with a guy from Boston who was born in Nigeria named Uchenna Ikone. He said, hey, I'm going down to Nigeria and I'm going to find these guys. I'm not going to rip you off if you help fund my trip. I'll go down there, I'll find these guys. And guess what? I'll find some records for you. You can pay them, you know, what I would pay and I'll send them back to you or I'll bring them back. He was there for over a year and I kept sending money to him but he kept sending me contracts back and I knew they were signed by the band members because he would send me photos, photos like, you know, from photo albums of a lot of these guys. Somehow he found an unplayed copy of the record in a radio station and Madlib actually ended up sampling a track uh, off of this for his Beat Conductor in Africa record and I've been talking with most deaf about doing a, a song with it because it's one of Most Def's favorite Madlib beats from that album. And we've licensed the entire album from the band leader, Franklin Yazura, who currently lives in Texas of all places. Well, you know, in the same way that I watch, you know, History Channel and you know, or whatever the hell that thing's called, American Pickers, I don't even know, like, you know, and these guys, you know, digging up, you know, America's history one piece at a time and like all this cheesy stuff. It's like, you know, I, I think it's kind of corny, but at the same time, you know, it is sort of true. I mean, the days of going into a record store and like pulling out a copy of Carlene and the Groovers in, you know, South Carolina, those days are over, you know what I mean? And it's, it's on people like me, I think, to go a little bit deeper. And, you know, that's what we do. So, you know, car, call it archiving, call it archaeology, just, just call it exploration. I mean, you know, it's what we do. We, we dig a lot deeper. This I listened to before I bought. I listened to it digitally. Someone had sent me the files as, you know, MP3s or burned me a CD or something in 2001 or 2002, right before I went down to Brazil for the first time. I looked for this record when I went down to Brazil, I couldn't find it. My second trip to Brazil, I was lucky enough to find a copy of the record. And I brought it home, and I listened to it, and I played it to my wife. My wife who speaks fluent Portuguese because she's Portuguese. She used the record to teach me Portuguese. Now if I just had the files, would that have happened? I don't know, maybe not. But the fact that this record was sitting there certainly led to this. That to me is a super important story.